Well, we want to finish up a little bit and talk about bearing burdens and meeting needs. How wonderful it is to say, I will wait for you, O oh God. But you know when you're going through the storms? Anybody ever been through a storm? It just feels intense, right? Like you're going through and you're like, Lord, I'm waiting. I, I just want to remind you that I'm waiting. You know, it just seems to go on for some time. This famous preacher that we all knew well, Charles Swintall, once said, Kindness is a language that deaf people can hear and that blind people can see. Do you get that? Let me read it again. Kindness is a language that deaf people can hear and that blind people can see. Kindness goes a long, long way. When we're talking about bearing each other's burdens, we, we need to undergird that with God's truth as well as the practical outworking of kindness. So we're going to look at Galatians 6 and 2, which says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Well, we really, to get the full understanding of this, we need to back up to verse 1, just for a fuller context and read all the way to verse 8. So let's try that. Verse 1 says, Brethren, if anyone is caught... In trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Now, this verse always makes me wonder about the woman who was caught in adultery, caught, and all these people are there. And I always think to myself, now, how'd y'all catch her? Y'all get that? How how'd you, were you there? How do you know? How did you catch her in this act? But then I like that it presses even further to, okay, so you have discovered that someone's in sin. How will you respond? You who are spiritual, restore such a one. Yes, you have discovered that someone is in sin. How will you respond? Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting, but to himself alone and not to another. Verse 5, for each one will bear his own load. Now, mind you, we had a burden, and now we have a load. We need to distinguish between the two. Verse 6, the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a person sows. This he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. Now, let's get a little background before we go forward. Who's writing? I heard it. Yes. Now, the New American Commentary says this. It's possible that Paul is dealing with serious moral lapses that are occurring with frequency among these Galatians. So, yes, our commitment here is to those who are caught in sin. But instead of condemning our sisters when they're caught in sin, we should seek to speak the truth in love. You know, I've had a lot of ladies tell me, well, I just told her the truth. Yes, you did, but was it in love? How did you communicate this truth? And did you encourage them in their situation? We must seek to rebuke them if necessary. Listen, you can't say that you love your sister if you're not willing to speak the truth in love if you're not willing to speak the truth. See, sometimes we worship friendship more than we worship truth. You know, we would rather you be friends and still like me than tell you the truth. We would rather offend God than offend man. We need to rebuke if necessary and then hold them accountable to true repentance. You know, there's a difference between just, I'm sorry because I got caught versus I'm truly repentant. I, I, I agree. I confess. I agree with you, God, that this thing that I have done is wrong, and I am repenting. I am changing my mindset on it, my belief system, my ways, and I am seeking to long, no longer pursue it. Hold them accountable. If necessary, identify others in your body that could counsel them through the situation. So this is how we handle someone who is caught in sin. We don't ignore it, 
but we don't condemn it either. My husband always says, we don't condone sin. We don't condone sin, but we don't condemn sin either, right? We address it in love. Now, we must deal with this, you who are spiritual. Who do you think he's talking about? Talking about us. You who are are spiritual. If you are so spiritual, then you are to demonstrate your spirituality by acting responsibly and lovingly with your fallen brothers and sisters. So here's the thing. We catch someone in a particular sin. We're supposed to respond in love and grace and compassion, we who are spiritual. If we are truly so spiritual, then we will not add sin to sin, evil to evil, we will respond in love. So now, let's go back. Let's go back to verse 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. This shows your motivation for rebuke. Do y'all get that? It's not just to tell somebody off because they are sinning against you or their sin has caused you great distress. The the object here is restoration. God is a God of restoration, not payback, not evil for evil. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. When's the last time that you can remember, you don't have to answer out loud, that you rebuked someone? Was it gentle? Let me pick on the married people. The last time your husband got on your last nerve. Mm-hmm. How did that come out? <laughs> I said, don't else. No, but she said, yeah, not, not too well, right? Restore such a one. And, and most of the time, I'll follow up to what she said, most of the time, they didn't even sin. They just didn't do something that we wanted them to do the way we wanted them to do it. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. What is the meaning of Restore. It means to put in order, to set right. The word restore is also used in the Bible to mean to mend like a bone, to mend, to be made complete, to overhaul. So if you have someone that you've caught in sin or who has sinned against you, you want to mend the situation. You want to reconcile the situation. You want to restore the situation. But that's not usually how we approach that now, is it? Oh, well, you said what you said, so I said what I said, and we did what we did, and now you're going to get it, right? <laughs> but that's not the heart of this scripture. The heart is restoration here. We are to restore. Now let's go on to verse 2, and let's read it again. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing one another's burdens is not an option. Just like hospitality is not an option, bearing one another's burden is not an option. This will fulfill the law of Christ. This is the act of showing Christ-like love to your sister. If you truly love her, you will bear her burden. Now, we could say this text only applies to sin issues. But as I was doing some research, a few of the commentaries showed where we really could have an extended application for this, that it may extend well beyond just a sin issue. Yes, Paul is admonishing the spiritually mature to help restore those who have fallen into sin. Yes. However, the New American Commentary says this, bearing burdens cannot be restricted to the one situation alone a sister in Christ that is caught in sin. They're saying that this also could be a way to lead into something that has more to do with the word burden. So I looked up the dictionary. I said, well, how do you define it? Let's define it even further. Well, what is a burden? A burden is something that is carried, something that is oppressive, something that is worrisome, something that weighs you down. Well, let's define it again from the New American Commentary. The word for burden, baros, means literally a heavy weight or stone. Someone is required to carry for a very long distance. Something that they've got to carry, like in um, that young lady's story, she's got to carry that for a while. 
Her husband may never be the same. This is a weighty experience. Figuratively, it came to mean any oppressive ordeal or hardship that is difficult to bear. Well, I remember my grandmother and them used to say, tote this for me. You ever heard that? It's the older word, tote this for me. Now, I was raised, uh, they were the boomers. Well, before them, the, the, the original generation, the older, the elders. So when they said tote something, they meant it and they weren't going to say it again, right? And it didn't mean just pick it up when you feel like it, put it down where you want. No, pick it up and take it wherever I told you to take it right now. Tote something for me. It has that same feeling. The word tote is an old-fashioned English word. It means to tote something. It's not simply to pick it up and put it back down. It's rather to carry or to haul this heavy load, usually on one's arms or back for a great distance, perhaps many, many miles. I remember my husband and I went on a missions trip and there were some ladies over there and they were, they'd gone to the grocery and they had everything in a basket and it was sitting on their head and they were just getting on down the street like it was nothing and, and I was thinking, I'd have no neck, life would be difficult, it would be a real situation with my back. I would have been trying to find somebody, babe, can you tote this for me? Like, I'm going to need you to take this wherever we're going. But they did it with grace and elegance. Sometimes you're so weighted down with the trials and the tribulations of this life, you just need somebody to come along and tote something for you. Well, what kind of burdens could we be facing as women? Temptations. I won't ask, have you ever been tempted? You're still breathing. So, <laughs> temptations. Family crisis. Sometimes things just break down in a family. Rebellious children. Children doing things they ought not to do. Things that you thought never would happen. Financial crisis. Health crisis. Sometimes it's even a burden to deal with the consequences of your sin. They're there. They're real, but they could be weighty. Loss of a child. Loss of a parent. Divorce abandonment, loss of a job. Sometimes you just need somebody to come along and help you go along on the journey for a while. That's bearing one another's burdens. As I told you earlier, my mother passed away February 18, 2021 at 5.45 p.m. How do I know exactly? Because I was standing there and I was able to watch her take her last breath. Burdensome indeed, sweet, and how God did it, but burdensome indeed. I can remember planning the funeral and going through all the processes of administration that you have to go through for something such as that. And I remember my, my dad was just vacant. He, he was there, but he wasn't there. So there were so many things to do. And I can remember the night of the wake. Y'all know what a wake is? Okay. Because some people don't do that anymore, you know what I mean? Like, but I understand why. But anyway, so the night of the wake, I remember we were leaving the funeral home and we got to the parking lot. And in my head, because you're burdened, right? All I could think was, I'm just leaving her here. I'm just leaving her here with people I do not know. And I lost it. I had been so caught up in administration that my feelings and my emotions finally caught up. And, and I don't know if you've ever had an extreme loss in your life to where you don't even have the strength to hold yourself up. There's nothing left within you to keep going. And I just fell. But there were some women there that caught me. I don't know where they came from. They came in like, you know, Superman. But I didn't hit the ground. But for them, I would have hit the ground. You see, Ecclesiastes talks about two are better than one because when one falls, there's another there to pick you up. See, bearing one another's burden is about toting something, being there for them, carrying them in a very weighty time in their life. So how can we do this? How can we bear one another's burdens? Well, the very first thing is you need to cultivate a relationship so that you can even be aware of the need. It's really, really hard to be there for you if I don't know what you're going through. Now, that's twofold. One, you have to be willing to share, right? None of us are mind readers. We can't know. I was counseling this lady one time, and she said, do you know I was sick? 
and I was in the hospital and nobody from the church called me. Nobody. I said, that's interesting. Did they know you were sick? Did they know you were in the hospital? They just should have known. Did you call them and tell them? Did you call the church secretary and tell her to tell the pastor? Tell pastor, I'm down here at this hospital. Well, no, I just figured that they should know. That's very difficult. It is very difficult. God did not call us to be mind readers. If you do not share it, we do not know. If you do not share it, we can't carry it with you. You have to do so. Now, the other side of that is that once you do share it, we need to come alongside you. That means being in relationship with you. Then the next thing about bearing burdens is that we need to prepare our hearts and our minds for the inconvenience. Remember last night we talked about being inconvenienced. Bearing another's burden is definitely an inconvenience, right? But it is a love, a love, a love that goes well beyond our inconvenience. But thinking about bearing a burden, you've got to remember the other part of the verse said load. We need to distinguish between bearing a burden and carrying a load. And since it's the end of the day, I'm going to ask you, what do you think a load is and how is it different than a burden? What do you think? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Yes, she needs a gift. Yes. <laughs> You need to be careful that you do help with the burden, but do not carry someone's load. Let's define it. Definition of a load is exactly what she said. It's things that they are required to do. If that sister is required to do something then, and she has the ability, be it physically, mentally, or financially, and she has the ability to do so, then she needs to take care of her responsibilities. Keeping financial commitments or family commitments, if she has the ability to do that, then she needs to do that. I've counseled a lot of wives who they tell me, my husband just told me to tell his job, his boss, when he called that he wasn't here, but he's sitting right here. His responsibility is to his job, to his boss. If he wants to lie, then that's between him and his God and his boss, right? Do not carry things for others and definitely don't send for them. Their responsibility could be keeping professional or job commitments, keeping church commitments. This is where my husband would say, hello, lights and walls. Anybody out there? <laughs> keeping church commitments. Do not do for others what they can do. Sister Sally signed up to bring the paper plates. But we all know that Sister Sally never keeps her commitments. So we're just going to go on and buy some paper plates because we know she's not going to bring them. Instead of telling Sister Sally, Sally, hey, Chica, what's up with the plates? You said you were going to bring them. Instead of holding her accountable and responsible for the commitment that she made, we move around it thinking we're helping her. We're not helping her. We're not helping her to grow. Helping her means to lovingly rebuke her, lovingly speak to her about keeping her commitments. So what is our charge? We are to bear one another's burdens. The New American Commentary says this. It says, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Let me tell you how that works out in church life. I'm going to use Sister Lynn Scott. She's gifted. She's talented. She has a lot of things she's working with, right? So then what if all the rest of us decide we're just not we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, and we certainly are not going to do any of that. Sister Lynn Scott has it. I'm going golfing. I'm going to the beach. I'm going sledding with my kids. I'm going to go take a nap and a bubble bath and all this other stuff because she's got it. Well, now, let me just, let me just tell you 
then what you have done is just taken all of the things that you could do and dumped them at her feet, and you have now burdened her down. Oh, we would never do that, right? We would, right? We would never do that. But you know we're doing that? You know how we're doing that? We don't show up. We don't serve. We don't volunteer. Or if we do, it's every now and again. We decide, ah, it's just church. I'm not going today. Every time you don't show up with your part, with your gift to take care of the body, somebody else has to do it. So what did you just do? You left your responsibilities, your task, your gifts to someone else. I'll read that again. There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If I'm able to get here, if I'm able to contribute, if I'm able to do my part, then I need to get about the business of doing my part. Because if I don't, I am causing the other part of the body to suffer because not only do they have to do their part now they have to do my part is that love is that kindness is that consideration even so ultimately what is our charge well first thessalonians 5 and 14 says this it says we urge you brethren to admonish the unruly Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So it doesn't matter where we are, whether we're unruly, whether we're faint-hearted, whether we're weak, we are to be patient with everyone. Now, the text does not say that being patient means not rebuking, and I hope that's what's coming across. At times, we need to lovingly go to one another and say, sister, We've been missing you. We need what God gave you. We need you to come and show up. Oh, you're so gifted here and there. Nobody can do this as well as you. But at the same time, we need to love her enough to when she's in a season where she can't. She's fainthearted. She's weak. She's going through a trial and tribulation that we do make up the difference. But here's what typically happens. Let's say that I'm out, I'm sick, I'm down, I can't come, I can't do what I'm supposed to do, I can't use the gifts that God has given me. So then you decide you're going to fill in for me. So then I'm at home, I'm healed, I'm better, but I've gotten used to being at home. It's kind of nice at home. You know I'm only child, did I say that? <laughs> it's quiet around here. They don't, they don't need me down at that church. They're getting along. Look, 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 the ministry's still running. The church doors haven't closed. Each part needs to do its part so that the whole can grow. If your church is going to grow, if it's going to expand, if the ministry that God has given your pastor is going to grow, each person must do their part. Now, that's not beyond what you can do right? That's what you can do when you can do it and how you can do it. So we urge you, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. You have some sisters who may not know how to teach yet. Sign them up for a class and show them how to teach. You have some sisters who may not know how to do a visitation, like a hospital visitation. Girl, come go with me. Let's go. I'm going to show you how to do this. Because you know there is a right and a wrong way to do hospital visitation, right? Ask Sister Lynn Scott about it. She'll tell you. Um, there is a right and a wrong way. Quick sidebar. We had a young lady in our church who had a heart condition. And we knew that one day soon the Lord would call her home. Well, he actually did. She just went to sleep one night and never came out of it. Um, so I went to the hospital to be with the family. I went to the hospital to be with the family. Mm, all right. I went to the hospital. Thank you. Hallelujah. I told you I'd go home and find that amen and that hallelujah last night. You need to go. Go, right? It's not good enough just to be on the phone being like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. No, you go. So I go to the hospital. I'm there with the family. In walks a chaplain, right? You can tell he's a young, new, fresh chaplain, don't know what he's doing, right? Shouldn't have been there. And he comes into the room. Now, she's on a life support vent, right? And the family's just kind of sitting around because they're kind of waiting to see if her organs will be useful for donation, right? That's a hard situation all by itself. 
So he comes in and this is what he says, chaplain. Well, hello everyone, how are you doing? So the family's just looking at him like, "Uh uh-huh. Oh, what brings her here today? And they're just looking at this man and he said, well, I certainly hope she gets better. So they all looked at me like, you want to get this or shall I get this? And I was like, I I got it, I got it. This is interesting, like, you need to go. If nothing else, listen, I didn't have a role there. My role was support. My role was to bear that burden. That was a heavy burden for them to decide if they were going to allow her organs to be used. That was a heavy burden for them. Their family member just passed or is in the process of passing, not coming back. Sometimes it's not that you do anything. It's just that you're there. You know what I mean? Bear that burden, that that heaviness of somebody's going through. The husband walks away or the husband is found in adultery. The, The children pass away, commit suicide. We had a friend, the child, she committed suicide in the house. Now, we would rather not really feel the weight of that, right? But we bear the burden. We go. We go and be there for one another. So what are we saying? We're saying that you are to bear one another's burden, you are to speak the truth in love, you are to admonish the unruly. This doesn't mean letting people off the hook just because they're cute, kind, and cuddly, right? You you do rebuke, but in love. But not only that, you don't carry their load. So a lot of times people will catch me after this session, and here are some of the questions they ask. Well, Well, how do I know if it's a load? If you're still paying her light bill and she go to work every day, you still picking up her children because she's in her car doing whatever it is that she's doing. If you're doing all these things, then what is she doing? If you are still taking care of whomsoever that has the ability to take care of themselves and your house is suffering, are you carrying a load or are you bearing a burden? If you have that family member that continues to call you and your finances are challenged at your home, so you take your money, your offering unto the Lord, and you give it to the family member who then runs it right on down to the racetrack, are you bearing the burden or are you carrying the load? Sometimes you just have to stop for a moment and think it through, and then the light bulb will come on and you're like, nope. Can't do it for you. Can't do it for you. I want to close this up a little bit with this illustration. And I think it's pretty relevant. It says, there's a story of a little girl who went ice skating and fell on the ice and slipped into a coma. When she woke up after six days, she was not able to talk or move. Like any good parent, her mother was terribly distressed. Yet she cared for her daughter day in and day out for 30 years. This mother did the unbelievable. She carried her daughter on her back year after year, sometimes falling and breaking her own bones. One day when the mother was 65 years old and her daughter, now a grown woman, she was asked how she was able to carry her daughter around all those years. Her reply was simple. She ain't heavy. She's my daughter. You see, the, 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 the lesson here is that when you truly are bearing a burden, it's not heavy for you. You understand? It's not heavy for you because you know this person is in need and you are willing to do whatever it takes to help them. That's when you know you're bearing a burden. But when you are not carrying your own load and you put it on someone else, it's like this mother. You're causing their knees to break. You're causing them to fall to the ground because you've stacked your load on top of their load. Is that love? Is that kind? This whole weekend, we've been talking about woman-to-woman ministry. I want you just to remember a couple things as you go out and into your day. Remember, we are sisters in Christ. We are sisters in Christ. We are blood-bought believers, bought by the blood of Christ. We are related to each other. I love you, and it ain't nothing you can do about it. And we 
are going to be related all throughout eternity. We are sisters in Christ. We all need help at some point. We need to be willing to say, I need help. If you don't sound the alarm, we don't know that you need help. And then you've got to be willing to let us help you. Mm, I'm going to say that again for the folk in the back. You are going to have to be willing to let us help you. And sometimes the help that you need might be a nice little um, correction. Showing love to one another is a very key element in our Christian walk. We must show love to one another. Love will always be for us in the character and resemble Christ's likeness, meaning it needs to be gentle, it needs to be kind, it needs to be patient, it needs to be long suffering. And some of us are a little more trying. You know what I mean? Like some of us, you gotta bear with long until we get it together, but that's the way it works. Somebody bore with you. Bear with one another, bear one another's burdens. Now, I wanna give you a moment to put it into practice, because sometimes we hear a lot, then we rush on out, and it stays right here on the floor. I'm gonna take two minutes, I think I might have two minutes, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, do you need anything? How you doing? You all right? Not that church Sunday. Girl, how you doing? No, stick around for the answer. Turn to your neighbor. Ask your sister. How you doing? You all right? You need something? (laughs) Okay. Did we learn some things about each other? Encourage one another? I'm going to ask you to read this with me and see where it lands with you inside. And I'm going to ask Sister Lynn Scott if she'll come up and pray for us when we're all done. But I want to read these verses again. Can we read this out loud together? Can you see it? Okay. Let's start with verse 1. Brethren. Bear. Amen. Amen. Amen.